to chair the session i invite on to the dais the chairpersons dr deepa m additional professor in obstetrics and gynecology government medical college trivandrum and next i invite dr anand martandu pillai consultant in interventional cardiology and electrophysiology anantapuri hospital trivandrum over to the chair so this session we have four eminent speakers and we start with hypertension young females by dr sarita s nair dr sarita is a consultant cardiologist at meditrina hospital patam and the hypertension is on the rise so that the prevalence is about 35 to 38 percent in kerala and this increase in reflect is reflected in the obstetric population also i invite dr sarita to the stage good afternoon teachers my dear friends thank you dr anupama for this opportunity so it's actually 10 minutes topic so hypertension is a vast topic and i'll have to rush through it so hypertension in young females i'm dealing only with young females so what is young which age group you take as young females that is a controversy now i am taking here less than 45 years according to the esa guidelines it is the most common and readily identifiable and reversible risk factor for mi stroke heart failure aortic dissection peripheral artery disease but the problem is it is usually asymptomatic only when you check the bp you will find that the patient is having hypertension and this can delay the diagnosis so it can produce target organ damage and even in young age group most common is still essential hypertension unless it is a pediatric age group and this is the prevalence of hypertension is mainly a us study you can see that it increases as age increases but in uh, blacks you can see that in the young uh, middle aged females and up to 60 65 years it is still high and this is grading of blood pressure in adults normal is taken as less than 120 80 we all know then pre hypertension 120 to 139 and 80 to 89 and stage 2 above 160 and 100 dias uh, diastolic bp So you can see that systolic BP definitely increases with age, but diastolic after the age of 50, 55 it comes down. So you get a white blood pressure in uh, older age group. And uh, you can see that only in the pediatric age group the uh, secondary hypertension has got the upper hand. But right from teenage, that is 13 to 18 years onwards, it is mainly the uh, essential hypertension which is uh, uh, having the upper hand. so first thing about the uh, clinical approach in a young hypertensive is four things we have to most important that is first is you have to confirm whether the patient is having hypertension or not in many cases it may be due to stress it may be white coat hypertension so you have to, you may have to do an ambulatory bp in the patient then second is whether the patient has got a target organ damage already the patient has developed a target organ damage or not then third point is identification of other risk factors it is any, any comorbidities which can lead on to further damage and next is secondary cause of hypertension in younger age group definitely you have to rule out secondary cause of hypertension especially in certain conditions which i'll be dealing with later so first of all you have to confirm high bp at least you should have two readings 5 minutes apart preferably over two visits and uh, confirm the elevated reading in the other arm also and pediatric age group definitely you should take bp in all four limbs at least once then if you are suspecting uh, white coat hypertension that is the patient is not having any target organ damage the patient is having only bp when coming to office no other symptoms you should definitely do an ambulatory bp and rule out a white coat hypertension that is when you, the patient will be having bp only when the uh, patient is coming to hospital when you meet the doctor and uh, this is next is target organ damage in uh, cardiac will usually have uh, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy which you can see in ecg as a lvh with strain that is a t inversion asymmetric t inversion the lateral leads so this may be an indicator but need not be present in all but echo is more sensitive even even if ecg doesn't have a lvh uh, finding you can see it in echo in echo this is uh, usually you don't see so much of hypertrophy this is the, here you can see there is a massive uh, left ventricular hypertrophy then next target organ is kidneys that is you should look for microalbuminuria that is urine albumin to creatinine ratio that is uh, if it is 30 to 300 microgram per milligram definitely it has produced some damage to the kidney 
and uh, ultrasound evidence of arterial wall thickening as well as atherosclerotic plaque and uh, hypertensive retinopathy, then uh, carotid intimal plaque, all these are important. Then next is you have to identify comorbidities. A hypertensive is a 2.5 times more likely to develop diabetes in the next 5 years and another important thing that we see in the young uh, females is obesity. More than two thirds of young hypertensive are either overweight or obese. Then uh, associations dyslipidemia, then smoking and tobacco use, definitely it is there in females also nowadays and stress, stress is another important factor which can lead on to hypertension. So just an overview of what you should do. That is, first of all, you have to test the accuracy of your reading, the correct cuff size. For example, in obese, if you are using a smaller cuff size, it may be incorrect. Then repeat office readings. Suppose you uh, definitely think that it is a white coat hypertension, you should definitely check in a, at least one month interval. And once you have confirmed the hypertension, then you should do certain uh, screening uh, laboratory tests, which I will come to later. And once you have confirmed, you can start the drugs. So then what are the risk factors of secondary hypertension? That is. Uh, when there is a poor response to therapy, that is you are taking it as a resistant hypertension, more than three drugs, still the patient is not responding, already there is significant target organ damage, then uh, uh, that is stage three hypertension and very young age, it is less than 20 years of onset and without any family history and other uh, findings which may suggest a secondary hypertension. So the younger the patient and the higher the BP, the more likelihood it is to be a uh, resistant hypertension. So then another important thing is pseudo resistance. We may think that we are giving almost three drugs or even more than three, but still the patient is coming back with uh, very high BP. So uh, most important is excessive sodium intake. That is what we usually see. There is excess sodium intake plus inadequate therapy. The doses may not be adequate. And another thing is over the counter drugs. O also NSAIDs, OCPs, herbal supplements, excessive alcohol intake, all these can lead to a pseudo resistance. So routine laboratory testing which again for comorbidities and other uh, causes of secondary hypertension you should look uh, blood count, blood chemistries, fasting glucose, lipid profile, urine analysis and a 12 day DCG for target organ damage. Then uh, most important is what is the goal? The goal is less than 140-90. Earlier according to the new guidelines the goal is universally 140-90 unless the age is above 60. Uh, you can make it 150, you can wait up to 150 and only then you need to start drugs. Earlier for CKD, chronic, uh, kidney disease and other comorbidities it was 130-80, but now everywhere it is 140-90. So what does the JNC 2018 guidelines say? Most important is always you should try a lifestyle intervention before you start on drugs. That is heart healthy diet, reduce the sodium intake, potassium supplementation, increase the physical activity, limiting the alcohol consumption and then only then pharmacological intervention. Again, you can see that lifestyle modification definitely decreases the BP, almost uh, 8 to 14 in dietary restriction. And you can see that uh, a 5 millimeter reduction in BP can reduce the stroke risk as well as the all-cause mortality. So the f drug of choice is always, it is first line is ARB or AC inhibitor plus or minus a CCB or calcineal blocker or diuretics. Always diuretic thiazide is, in older age group, it is better to give a calcineal blocker or thiazide to start with. Beta blockers have come out almost of the hypertension management. Only if there is an associated coronary artery disease or angina or any other post-MI patient, only you give beta blockers. And once you give three drugs, it is uh, still the patient is having hypertension, only you take it as resistant hypertension. Same with ESC guidelines also. The only difference is that in both these guidelines, in the JNC guidelines, they take three to six months of lifestyle intervention, only then you start on drugs. And in ESC guidelines, you go up to six to 12 months of lifestyle intervention, and only then you start drugs. Only if the patient is coming with grade two hypertension, you start drugs. And that too, two drug combination. That is a, uh, the new uh, difference. This I have already mentioned. I'm just rushing through because the time is almost out. And now I have only <laughs> secondary hypertensions. We, we all know what are the common things, renal parenchymal disease, renovascular again, uh, fibromuscular usually in young females, commonly in young females that is in distal part of renal artery and the renovascular slightly older age group and primary aldosteronism again. And another important thing that we see nowadays even in young females is obstructive sleep apnea. That is m one of the most common causes, uh, obesity. And here also the AC inhibitor is always the first drug of choice. Then you have got pheochromocytoma is a rare condition. 
then uh, coarctation at a younger age too, you have a significant uh, hypertension or blood pressure response and there will be severe LV dysfunction as you, when you diagnose at later age group. And in females specifically, you have certain conditions, pregnancy induced hypertension, OCP, weight loss agents like Sibutram, which is not usually seen in our place. Then pregnancy and hypertension, one of the important causes of maternal morbidity and mortality. And this you, you majority of here, are, I think gynecologists, they are better than me in managing this. So they have endothelial dysfunction causing abnormal remodeling of placental spiral arteries and associated with other end organ damage and end organ perfusion will be reduced. And what we see usually is these pregnancy in this hypertension patients will come back with the uh, essential hypertension sometimes. And that is, uh, they'll have right from young age, so they have more of target organ damage. And these are, this is just the classification of hypertension and uh, bed rest, salt restriction, and again, urgent delivery. And the drugs we usually use are beta blockers, particularly labitalol, but the problem is it can produce IUGR and radical in the baby. And methyl dopa, there is no adverse effect, but it's less effective, I think, for um, eclampsia. Thank you. There are no other questions. We'll move on to the next uh, talk, which is control of diabetes with diet uh, by Dr. Srijit N. Kumar. <laughs> So, uh, uh, dear uh, distinguished delegates, at the outset, let me congratulate Dr. Anupama for uh, this wonderful CME and thank you, uh, Ayame Trivandrum, for this very kind invitation. And also, let me thank uh, and congratulate Dr. Srikumar for the excellent organization of the event. Now, I don't have slides, so probably you'll be <laughs> forced to look here for the next uh, 12 to 14 minutes. And I'm supposed to speak on uh, diet in the management of diabetes. 2017 was a path-breaking year in the management of diabetes. Not a single new drug was found in 2017. What happened was a path-breaking study which got published in the International Diabetes Federation meeting in December 2017, a study by Mike Lean and Roy Taylor in which they divided 300 odd patients into two groups. Nearly 150 patients received intense lifestyle modification by which they gave around 800 calorie diet for some time, reduced the weight, and the other group got the best possible medical therapy. One year later, they found that those patients who were managed with intensive lifestyle and in those subset of patients who lost more than 15 kilograms of weight, in 86 percentage of patients, they did not require any drug even after one year of treatment. Those were diabetes with a mean duration of one to six years and with a mean BMI between 27 to 40, 45. So moderately obese or obese diabetics and relatively early onset diabetes with weight loss, with intensive weight loss, 86% went into remission. So earlier we used to think that once diabetes, lifelong diabetes, but now probably categorically we can say that at least in a subset of patients, diabetes is reversible. The person can go normal. And why did it happen? Of course, when a patients uh, lo lost less than 15 kilos, still many went into remission, not to the tune of 86%, from around 10% onwards, with every kilo of weight loss, more and more patients went into remission. And why it happened? We have all learned that diabetes basically comes from insulin resistance, especially type 2 diabetes. There are a lot of other factors. There are at least eight other factors which act. But primarily, it is insulin resistance which causes type 2 diabetes. And where does this insulin resistance come from? The insulin resistance comes from the adiposity or the increased fat in this body. And where does the increased fat come from? It comes from the food we eat. So it's very simple. We determine whether we are going to be fat or not 
and we determine whether we are going to be diabetic or not. Not just diabetes, any of the lifestyle diseases. So who controls the disease? We ourselves control our disease. So if fat is responsible for this disease, would it be that if you take care of the fat, if, you, if, if a person can reduce the fat, will the disease disappear? Yes, and that's what they found. That's exactly what they found. So then we come to this question on how this fat accumulates. We take in food because we all need energy and we spend energy through various measures. If your energy consumption is more than your energy expenditure, then the excess energy gets converted to fat. So that's looks very simple but then we have one more step when glucose go into the system this glucose is regulated by insulin which comes from the pancreas and the insulin diverts the glucose to liver to muscle and to fat cells the muscle uses the energy to make ATPs, it uses the glucose to churn out ATPs which it requires for its various activities. The liver takes it up and then uses it and also stores a little as glycogen which can be, you know, when you are not eating, which is which seldom occurs, but if at all you are not eating for a few hours, then this glycogen will come to use. The liver will start breaking glycogen, that is what is called glycogenolysis. So for that, the liver will take up little glucose. But after some time, the muscle and glucose, liver gets fed up. They can't take any more glucose. But then you have the fat cells. They will keep imbibing as much glucose as possible and convert them into fat. And the hormone which regulates that is insulin. So when you have high insulin levels, more and more of your energy is going into the fat cells. And when you have less insulin, glucose wouldn't go to the fat cells. That's why persons with insulin deficiency go lean. And when you start replacing with insulin, the person goes fat. So, we need to decrease our energy intake we need to increase our energy expenditure and also we need to keep our insulin levels low because if your insulin levels are high, more of your energy is going into the fat and the person is going to become obese. So we have three principles that is low energy intake, increased energy expenditure and low insulin levels to be maintained. I am talking about endogenous insulin, not those patients who would require insulin. So that would form the basis of our principle in managing diabetes through lifestyle. So two of these, that means your, your energy intake and your insulin levels would depend upon what you eat. And your expenditure would obviously depend upon how you are going to spend your day, your aerobic activities, your anaerobic activities and your activities of daily living. Now let me come back to the food which will ensure both an isocaloric diet as well as a diet which would not induce high insulin levels. Now how do you do that? Now first we need to understand that we all need energy for our routine activities and how much energy we need because anything other than water which we consume has energy. So the total energy requirement for a sedentary overweight person 
is 20 calories per kilogram. Maybe you can go up to 30, but definitely not beyond that. So that means we are talking about an energy intake of around, let's say 1200 to 1800 kilocalories. That's what we require. Now the second question is, from where should this energy come from? We all know that there are three big principles, principal elements of food, which are the carbohydrate, the protein and fat. Carbohydrate is definitely very important. Carbohydrate gives us energy and that's, it, it's an energy giving food. It doesn't have any other role. Protein is required for build up of various uh, enzymes and you know, making bone, uh, making muscles and a lot of structures involve intake of proteins. And fat is also required for, for synthesis of uh, various substances inside the body, the cell wall and so on. But the only role of carbohydrate is to give energy. And when you take in carbohydrate, please understand that various studies, I don't have time to go into the details, but I'll tell you various studies, including the latest pure studies, which was done in over 18 countries, categorically told that high carbohydrate intake is associated with increased mortality. Cardiovascular morbidity, diabetes, lifestyle diseases, increased mortality. So if you have to do one thing for your food, reduce your carbohydrate intake. The carbohydrate percentage cannot be more than 50 percentage. And when we are taking around, let's say 600 to 900 calories from your carbohydrates, please understand that 100 gram of rice would give somewhere around 180 to 200 calories and 100 grams of cucumber or tomato or green leafy vegetables would give you something like 18 to 25 calories. So if you want a bulk, you will have to increase your vegetables and even fruits. For example, oranges, apple have something like 40 to 50 calories. A banana has something like 75 calories. So the best choice is vegetable, then comes fruit and little or no rice, wheat, tubers and an absolute no to sugar. I'm not talking about diabetes. There is nothing called a diabetic diet. There is only a healthy diet. And what I'm talking is for everybody. The total calories from carbohydrates should be around, let's say around 700, of which the bulk should come from vegetables and some amount of fruit and very little from cereals and tubers and absolutely nothing from sweets. So that's the carbohydrate formula. Now let me tell you something, something it, it, it looks very simple. If a person has a fasting blood sugar of 100, his after food blood sugar let's say is 130, where did that th extra 30 come from? It came from his food. If his after food sugar is 200, where did that extra 100 come from? It came from his food. If the after food is 300, where did that extra 200 come from? It came from his food. So if he can eat a food with 30 or 40 glucose, which means carbohydrate when ultimately it gets assimilated as glucose, then his food, after food blood sugar cannot go up more than 140. We have made an intervention. Uh, we are right now going trying to compile the data and publishing in the idea of this year. It's, it's not a breakfast which we have designed. It's just a food plate breakfast which we have developed and which on an average rises the blood sugar only by 20 or 30. And that contains one dosha, some sprouts, tomatoes, cucumber, one egg, little fruit and a tea. And that's all what you will be able to eat. And then your sugar wouldn't go up more than 20 or 30. Isn't that marvelous? In many people you can do that. And when you give a low glucose meal, straight away, the postprandial sugar has come down. Maybe he goes off medication or his medication is reduced. Number one. Number two, who is the, is the sensitizer for secretion of insulin? That's glucose. So when your glucose go down, your insulin comes down. When your insulin comes down, your hyperinsulinemia, your adiposity comes down. So, carbohydrate does a lot of trick. Now, I have only two minutes left. One minute I'll devote for proteins and 
uh, uh, and uh, cholesterol and uh, fat. And the last one minute, I'll try to devote for something which is even more important. So proteins, 20% of your ca ca calorie intake, sprouts, egg whites, chicken, uh, you know, lean meat, fish and all. And 30% should come from fat, saturated fat, not considered to be very good, but now it's controversial. But anyway, let's limit it. Saturated fat come from coconut, oil, uh, mutton, beef and so on. Unsaturated fat is very good. Let's eat more of nuts and fish. And my last one minute, I'm going to devote for the most important thing, which is no food. <laughs> fasting. Now, let me tell you, fasting is the best you can do for your body. Not only because you are deprived of calories, which is actually good. We talked about low insulin. If you don't eat, your insulin is even lower, which is good. Fasting cannot be done by every diabetic. Someone who is on hypoglycemic drugs like insulin or sulfonylureas will not be able to fast. But majority of patients who are on metformin or gliptins or non-hypoglycemic drugs can fast. And let me tell you one more secret. Your body undergoes a process called autophagy by the lysosomes where body self repairs. In fact, the Nobel Prize went for the Japanese scientist who discovered that. And you know what is the best thing for that self repair mechanism autophagy? It's fasting. So when you are hungry, when you are starving, be happy that your body cells are undergoing repair. And when you keep on eating, especially when you are keep on eating meat, this mechanism is halted. And autophagy is very important for the prevention of many diseases, including cancer. And that's why fasting becomes important. 10 more seconds. If someone is keen to fast, start with 12 hours, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Sounds simple, but start doing that. If you can go one step more, 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. And probably ideal would be 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. And once in a while, if it could be 24 hours, 8 a.m. today you eat, 8 a.m. tomorrow morning you eat. But we have to at least start thinking of intermittent fasting because probably that is the way forward. And one single measurement which we need to follow to avoid lifestyle disease is maintaining a waist circumference of less than 80 centimeter in females and less than 90 centimeter in males. I thank all of you for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very enlightening talk. <coughs> I'm going to ask you the question I asked you yesterday, which was postponed to today. Uh, we would like to know your thoughts on this low carb, high fat, or the keto diet, so-called, which is a big fad these days. And I also want to add an observation that recently we have had a couple of middle-aged females who have come with acute myocardial infarction who did not have any other risk factors, but were on very strong keto diet. Okay. Now, uh, uh, thanks, Anand, for the question. In fact, uh, we were having some discussion until at 12 o'clock. Anand delayed us yesterday. He kept on asking questions when we had a CME yesterday. Uh, but anyway, thank you for that. Now, keto diet, I will not say it is absolute blunder because uh, I didn't have the time for that. But let me tell you, two things which can decrease your insulin levels are one is intermittent fasting or fasting. And the second thing is zero carb or a low carb diet. Because when you don't take carb, carbohydrates, if your fat, fat in your diet would not stimulate insulin secretion. So that is why in a high fat diet or a fat based keto diet, due, through various mechanisms, through various mechanisms, body weight will come down. Uh, ketosis is produced and body weight comes down. Now it's controversial whether that ketosis is good for the body. There are many literature and many evidences saying that there are many beneficial effects. However, there are a few concerns also raised. One of them is hypertension, another is albuminuria, some renal damage, elevation of LDL, but they have found that it is, you know, the, 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 it, it is the, the particle size which matters more, more than the LDL uh, per se, it is the LDL particle size which matters as far as coronary artery disease is concerned and probably it's not a huge concern. 
to 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 put a long story very short number 1 keto diet is not an absolute blunder and probably we will have to have more scientific thoughts into that two as if now it cannot be recommended for more than few weeks if at all for weight loss and for such maintenance you will have to go for some other diet three if someone asks your opinion whether i have to be on a keto diet to reduce your weight at this stage probably we'll discourage because we have excellent other methods for weight reduction and weight maintenance and the best method which ima of which me sapna benny all of us are members of that the ima food safety initiative the plate which we recommend is the food plate and food plate is very simple a big plate very big plate half the plate should be fruits and vegetables pinna matte pagadiyallo ullu baaki ella narakkan the other half half of which should be proteins and one quarter grain if you follow this plate you can be assured of a weight loss and that is very easy to maintain and if you keep maintaining that uh maintaining that plate then you can maintain the weight loss also so as if now i think the best plate to to recommend would be the food, food plate and most studies will have to go to all the other like mediterranean diet was mentioned in the morning so mediterranean diet dash diet uh, keto diet maybe we'll have to have more evidence on all these thanks rajesh for the wonderful lecture i have two questions what about the lean diabetics where can you reduce the weight second question is is this, this principle is same for bariatric surgery where they offer treatment of diabetes as a uh, an outcome or a primary objective yeah thank you very much rc since rc has asked i can take little more time to answer <laughs> so <laughs> so the first thing is what about lean diabetes now let me tell you all diabetes is not type 2 what i am talking primarily was about type 2 diabetes where insulin resistance is predominant and how will you determine whether the patient has insulin resistance you measure the waist and if someone has a waist of more than 80 90 or a body fat percentage of more than 25 in males and more than 35 in females or a body mass index of more than 23 then they would definitely benefit from the dietary intervention now if someone is lean and or if someone has type 1 diabetes or a maturity onset diabetes or a overlap of type 1 diabetes or an insulin deficiency diabetes obviously you will have to give insulin but even in that case even in type 1 the insulin is given for to cover the carbohydrates you take so it's quite logical that when your carbohydrate intake goes down your insulin requirement is bound to go down and even in the gdm patients when their carbohydrates can be restricted their insulin requirements would go down so that's the first question and in the second question was bariatric surgery absolutely i tell my patients you are going to undergo a surgery where which costs you routinely around 3 or 4 lakhs where you don't have to spend anything which would cut 80% of your stomach and throw it away you cannot take it back but here you will not lose it only thing is that fill your stomach with 20% calories so it produces the same effect same effect so without undergoing any surgery you can have that miraculous surgical effect by following a good food pattern next talk is on mental health uh, stress and lifestyle by dr um, arun binayar assistant professor in psychiatry at medical college trivandrum a very good afternoon to all of you and my sincere gratitude to the organizers for giving me this great opportunity our discussion would be centered around this topic of mental health stress and lifestyle over the next 12 minutes i'll be have i have to stop within 12 minutes because we are already running short of time so what is mental health in a single sentence mental health means becoming aware of the realities of your life accepting the realities of your life getting engaged in what you are doing flowing in the realities of your life developing a philosophy of life and reaching that philosophy through the roots which you call as values in your life it may be sounding very complicated but it is very simple as we understand the 
individual elements of mental health. So my discussion of mental health and stress would be centered around the female population, especially the concept of aging, as we call it, as we advance in our life. So I'd like to introduce the term stress also. As we all know, stress means general adaptation syndrome. The term general because the same kind of response is there towards different situations in life. Death of a loved one, winning of a lottery, failure in an examination, getting married, birth of a child, all these may produce similar kind of responses in the human body and mind. And that is why it is known as general. The term adaptation because it's the way in which our body and mind tries to adjust to, to cope with a change event in your life. And syndrome because different systems of your body are involved in this process. So we have different kind of scales to measure stress also. We have to quantify each and everything in life to make it scientifically valid. We have got something known as the presumptive stressful life event scale which was designed in 2000 in United States of America in which 67 life events have been scored based on the intensity of stress they produce. Number one happens to be death of spouse which is given 100 points. In 2013 when I had an opportunity to conduct a study about the reasons for stress among married population in Kerala. The result we got was astoundingly very different because there were a lot of females who told that death of spouse was the happiest moment in their life. <laughs> Understandable because many of the marriages in Kerala continue due to external reasons, not because of the true love between partners. And there is something known as perceived stress. Perceived stress means a particular incident may be extremely stressful to me because starving may be an extremely stressful event for me. But for Dr. Srijitan Kumar, it may be the happiest moment in life. So how do you perceive a particular event as? That is what is known as perceived stress. And we have got a scale for that also, which is known as PSS. So the idea of coping with stress, because stress is not something which is bad for your life. Stress, stress is something which helps to take the life forward. Every scientific discovery has been the result of stress, we should say. So how to cope with stress in a positive manner and how to productively utilize stress is the key. So females by nature are more predisposed to develop depression in their life. There are three hormonal reasons behind that also. So premenstrual dysphoria which happens in 8% of adolescent females because of hormonal reasons. Postpartum depression, which is likely in 42 days up to seven weeks after the delivery. And of course, a significant number of females develop postmenopausal depression with significant vasomotor symptoms, characteristically burning sensation and sweating even while you are trying to sleep in an air-conditioned room. And adding to this, lot of life rules which a female adopts. It's much more than the responsibilities which an average male takes up in life. Because bringing up children, looking up household, caring for the husband, managing a lot of other domestic things comes under the department of a female. And many males don't spend many, much time, especially in the care of children. So we have got geriatric depression, which is very common. Had a chance to visit the town called Tiruvalla. Uh, in the post-flood scenario last year. So I could see a place which was extremely well developed with palatial mansions, lot of financial institutions, lot of hotels, lot of bakeries, and lot of huge commercial establishments. And in most of these houses, I could come across geriatric couple who had already exported their next generation to the Western world, living alone. So coming to geriatric depression, there is a chance for cognitive impairment. We are at present conducting a study in association with Sri Jitra Institute to identify how many or what percentage of people who present with behavioral problems after 60 years progress to dementia over a period of 10 years. And some studies we have already uh, got in this field shows that any kind of depressive symptoms with onset after 60 years can predispose to cognitive impairment. Empty nest syndrome, what is this? Once your children have moved away from your place, especially in people who have invested tremendous amount of money, time and emotions on bringing up their children, 
there is this huge sense of vacuum which sets in after the children have moved away from their custody. Death of spouse, of course, if there is a true love between partners, is a very important problem. Medical illnesses of any nature, including lifestyle-induced diseases to neuro neurological disorders, to dementia, to whatever it is, is a very important turning point in life. And coping with that illness itself is a huge problem. And finally, the concept of loneliness, the situation in which you become lonely. As some philosophers have already told, loneliness is aloneness misunderstood. Loneliness is what the society does to you and aloneness is what you choose in life. Most of the complaints about loneliness is actually aloneness. You choose to be alone and you complain that you are lonely. So there are a lot of chronic medical conditions which a person can get at a certain stage of life. Many of them related to lifestyle. And depression is an accompaniment in most of these conditions. 70 percentage of Parkinsonism patients have depression. 40 to 70 percentage of dementia patients have depression. Cancer, the prevalence of depression range from 10 to 90 percent with highest prevalence in pancreatic cancer and brain tumors. Coronary artery disease, we have got 25 percentage of them developing depression in the immediate three month period after an episode of MI. And this depression, if untreated, could be an important risk factor for a re-MI in the next one year. And diabetes, again, the prevalence of depression may range from 20 to 45 percentage depending upon the chronicity of that illness. So these are the diagnostic criteria for a major depressive disorder in a human being. Out of these nine, if five are continuously present for two weeks, you can diagnose depression. But the biggest problem is imagine a person with diabetes on insulin. Imagine a person with coronary artery disease on half a dozen medicines. Imagine a person with malignancy on chemotherapy. I'm sure that each and every person with the above mentioned conditions would be having at least four of these nine symptoms without having depression. Maybe fatigue, sleep impairment, appetite impairment and concentration impairment. They are accompaniments of any chronic medical illness irrespective of the diagnosis. So you cannot utilize these four things, points number three, four, five and six to diagnose depression in a person with chronic medical illness. So we have got a new criteria called Endicode Substitutive Criteria, which helps to diagnose depression in a person with chronic medical illness. Instead of sleep impairment, appetite impairment, concentration impairment and fatigue, we look for these four new symptoms. Remaining immersed in thought, self-pity, pessimism about everything, especially the treatment. Pessimism about treatment is one of the most important factors which can negatively affect treatment adherence, including lifestyle modifications. Withdrawn behavior to one's own private world and difficulty in giving face to visitors even. That is another important feature of depression in medical illness. Fearful or tearful facial expression, the eyes may well up with tears and sometimes a fear regarding death, what after death, and what will happen to your relatives and loved ones after your death. These things may concern you. And finally, the telltale evidence of depression in a person with chronic medical illness is non-reactive mood. In a geriatric person with a chronic medical illness, if he is not responding to even his grandchildren, you can almost be sure that he is suffering from depression. So we have a lot of different methods to manage depression. A variety of antidepressants are available, but more than that, it is the lifestyle modifications or the psychological management which is important here also. So each and every human being would have a set of negative thought processes called schema. I'd give you an example for a schema. If at the age of five years, you had a sibling who was two years elder to you who was very bright in studies, it is very much possible that your parents might have compared you with your bright sibling and criticized you. Why don't you be like him or her? So after having listened to these kind of comparisons over a long period of time, you develop an idea in your mind that you are incompetent. And this concept is what is known as schema. Schema may become latent after a certain stage in your life. But after 10 or 15 years, when you have reached your college, after you have gone through multiple stressful experiences in life, the schema may become reactivated 
and based on the schema lot of new negative thought processes develop and those negative thought processes are called negative automatic thoughts if you have failed in an examination in a professional college the schema may become reactivated and you may develop a process called over generalization you would decide to skip the course altogether because you feel that you may fail in the subsequent exams as well so cognitive behavior therapy is a psychological treatment which will help to change these negative automatic thoughts including schema we have got some other psychological treatments also called acceptance and commitment therapy in which you accept the realities of your life and move ahead and there is the last one the mindfulness based cognitive therapy it is useful not only for depression even for diabetes it is useful because to have a healthy dietary practice which rijit sir was mentioning you need to change your behavior to change your behavior you need certain alterations in your psyche which would empower you to do well in uh, this aspect so there is an aspect called mindful eating mindful eating means appreciate the food material with all your sense organs see it touch it smell it keep it in your tongue appreciate the texture with the tongue slowly chew it listen the music of the chewing and feel the saliva mixing and the taste and feel it as it goes down through the throat if you appreciate the food with all these sense organs completely you would become satisfied with a small quantity of food so that is what is known as mindful eating which we are trying these days for the management of weight loss in our patients with diabetes also so the last concept i would want to highlight here is the concept of graceful aging there is a term called ageism ageism means certain behavioral patterns are attributed to old age there was a usage in our part of the world 60 kazhinjal puruburukum so many people after 60 years of age used to develop dementia and at the fag end of dementia they used to get auditory hallucinations and they used to respond to this auditory hallucinations this response to auditory hallucination was referred to as 60 kazhinjal puruburukum which means that the person is competent enough to get a passport to the outer world and you should make all arrangements so attributing certain behaviors to old age is what is known as ageism so ageism is not what is accepted right now it is the concept of graceful aging so how to age gracefully remain connected with as much of the society as possible develop a positive relationship with the youngsters learn from them rather than teaching from them that is very important think about what is the purpose of your life what do you want the next generation to remember you for that will be the philosophy of your life and the ways in which you reach that philosophy will be what is known as your values in life so be active both psychologically and physically do exercise and think in each and every moment of your life how your life is going to touch the life of others how many people are going to be influenced by your life if you have got lot of people going to be influenced by your life your life is successful and you have aged gracefully thank you very much for your very patient listening thank you dr arun any audience question are there any predictors for postpartum depression definitely there are quite a lot of predictors number one is family history of depression especially maternal depression number two is something called emotionally unstable personality traits during adolescence something which we call as borderline personality so people with unstable emotions inability to control any kind of emotions anger sadness happiness anything and recurrent suicidal gestures including cutting your wrist for trivial reasons etc so females with those emotionally unstable traits they are more predisposed to develop postpartum depression number 3 is presence of comorbid hypothyroidism if they have got hypothyroidism during their adolescence they are more likely to develop postpartum depression these are some of the very strong predictors for postpartum depression if there are no other questions we'll move on to the next Thank talk you. The next talk is on health and exercise and I invite Mrs. Uma Kalyani to come to the stage. Good afternoon everybody. First of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Aruma Anupama, Asi sir and the whole Pran team for giving me an opportunity. And uh, my topic for today is 
Actually, it is given as exercise and uh, fitness, but I have changed it a bit because I am a nutritionist and a yoga trainer. So I would like to uh, tell you a few uh, simple things, very, very simple things because you were listening to so many like surgical procedures and all. So I'm going to make it very simple, but a bit difficult to practice. And uh, half of my session is taken by our Srijit sir and a bit by Arun, uh, Arun sir. So glow as you age is a topic. So what is aging? Aging is a combination of bodily changes happens in the body. I mean, with the age, many factors such as food uh, habits, exercise, sleep, and stress can affect aging, as you all know. So first, uh, I would like to describe, like, definitely as we age, the body composition changes and the body weight also matters. And the more fatter or more obese or overweight you are, definitely you look more older, right? So definitely diet, I mean, the weight has got a very important role in uh, showing your aging changes. So in that, when you are uh, talking about the weight, definitely diet plays a major role. So what is a di uh, nourishing diet? A balanced diet which is needed to nourish the body as well as the mind. A healthy plate, as doctor explained, he made my job easy. So let us fill the half of the plate with vegetables and fruits, then one fourth with whole grains. We can have rice, wheat, everything, because many people come and ask uh, when they're coming for diet consultation, can I have rice? Should I completely avoid rice and all? Definitely you can have rice, but preferably whole grains like red rice or brown rice, the healthier variations and limit the quantity. Then one fourth should be the non-veg or dal or pulses for the protein requirement. So let me uh, take you through a few important, very simple points. But as I said earlier, it is very uh, like challenging. You need to be mentally very determined to follow these simple principles. So eat your food only when you are hungry. Let me ask you one question. Just now, maybe one hour before we would have had our lunch, right? Still, they gave us one kolkata and tea. How many of you didn't touch it at all? Still raise your hands. Only one, two, three people. So why did we eat? Just like that. They got something hot the AC hall, we let us have it. But it's not because we are hungry, right? So first one, eat your food only when you are hungry. So next time, let us try to follow that tip. Then use all the senses. Second thing, did you enjoy the Kolkata really or you were listening to something and eating? Again, yes, right? So let, uh, like uh, Dr. Arun said, let us enjoy the food. When the food is coming, look at the food, the shape of Kolkata. Then touch it, soft or <laughs> hard, then smell it, then let us enjoy the taste and preferably in a silent uh, setup, we have to eat our food. Then eat a wholesome, balanced breakfast, when, uh, which is your brain food. Most of the time, like we are in a hurry to go to office, so at least let us spend some time, five or ten minutes to enjoy and have our breakfast and let that be a nourishing food because that is the main thing which is going to take you throughout the day. Then next, each, uh, chew each bite eight to 10 times. E I mean, uh, chewing not only help us to digest the food better, but also each time when we chew our food, it is sending signals to our brain that we are, uh, when our stomach is getting full so that we don't overeat. Then eat, eat slowly and enjoy eating. And the stomach size is only the two fish size. As you all are doctors, I don't have to tell you. And out of that, in yoga tradition, we say out of the two fish size, only half of the fish we have to Fill with the food and the rest half, quarter should be filled with water and quarter should kept empty. And uh, don't eat if you are angry till the anger subsides. What could be the reason? Because when we are angry, the gastric secretions will be less and the uh, throat becomes dry, the saliva secretion will be less. Uh, that means the body is not in a condition to digest the food. So till the anger subsides, let us wait to eat. Then sipping water in between is okay, but not gulping too much of water. And eat locally available foods. Simple cooking is preferred because the more and more we are cooking the food, the nourishment goes, okay? So let us make it very simple whenever possible. Each meal should be colorful. As you know that reason also, the more colorful the food is, it will be more having more nutrients, especially antioxidants and all. Then after eating also, you should have the same energy level before. What is the meaning of that? First thing, when we are hungry only, then we are eating. And hunger also, we have to respect our body. When you are hungry, definitely eat your food. Don't, 
I mean, delay there, especially when you are in the hospital and all. Uh, till the patient, I mean, everybody finishes, you'll be waiting, right? So next time, let us try to give some time for ourselves also. So let, let's have something in between and then we'll continue the consultation. So that will definitely help you to energize your, yourself. Then after eating also, you should have the same energy because if you are filling up your stomach with too much of food again, it will be draining our energy. So the energy level should be that all these things, if you are becoming more aware about ourselves only, we can um, and check all those things. So before eating and not eat, eating too much so that the energy level can be maintained throughout. Then eating the dinner close to sunset. So around 6.30, maximum 7.30, if you can have your dinner and go to bed, light uh, stomach, you should feel, the stomach should feel light so that it will make you um, in, uh, get a good sleep and you can get up the next day morning fresh. The foods for healthy skin, so as all you know, like all of you know like uh, dark, uh, I mean dark colored vegetables, fruits, green leafy vegetables, green tea, sweet potato, tomatoes, all these things are I mean, loaded with antioxidants which are good for the skin. Then for healthy hair, because it's an anti-aging thing I'm mentioning all this, like as you know, protein rich, like egg, fish, olive oil, lentils, walnuts are good for the hair. Then for healthy nails, nuts and seeds. And in Kerala, I'm seeing like people eat more of fish, but not much of nuts and seeds. Now it is becoming a habit. Today morning also I saw there like a healthy corner was there, but now I think it is almost empty. But before when I was asking somebody, they said like nobody seen this and it was I mean, all filled up with the nuts and uh, like uh, dry fruits. So let us give little more importance to nuts and seeds. Then beans, lentils, herbs, carrots, and water. So next one is about exercise. Those who think they have no time for exercise will sooner have to find time for illness. So it is a bit threatening but still at times we have to tell our patients this way also. Then as we age not only the joints become stiff but also the blood vessels lose its flexibility, the muscle mass lowers, fat storage increases along with hormonal fluctuations. All these can, can be slowed down with exercise and active lifestyle. Sorry. So stay fit and age better with four types of exercise. Can I give you some practical tips also or some stretches? Are you ready? Yes, okay. So in yoga, like I don't promote only yoga, but I personally I do jogging as well as yoga as a main like exercise for myself. So yoga is a complete exercise, I would say, because it has got like aerobic. When you are doing it in a faster pace, it is an aerobic workout. Then when you are doing some balancing poses, it acts as a balancing exercise. Then it definitely, as all of you know, it increases the flexibility. Then uh, like what else? balance aerobic and strength training. Okay, shall we do something for strengthening our knees now? Yes, ready? Okay, then come. I think can Vidya, my friend is here. Can you just come and show some stretches? Come. Okay, ready. Can everybody stand up for some simple? Okay, so first you have to stand with the legs, keeping your both the legs together. Then slowly you have to bend your knees as if you are sitting in a chair. Very good, very good. Yes, sitting in a chair. Okay, very good. Stay there. One. Two, chair persons can also do the chair. Three, four, five. Come back once more. Come up. Very good. Now, I think some of them were like just now standing up. We'll do once more. Okay. Now, this time we can for a change take the hands also up. Slowly bend your knees. Very good. Slowly. Stay there. One, two, three, four, five. Excellent. Very good. So, this is a very simple knee as well as the ankle strengthening. Asana. We, this is called a chair pose or utkadasana. Okay. Next, shall we do something for the balance? Tree pose. Okay. Little more slowly, Vidya. Vidya is a classical dancer, so she might do it very gracefully and perfectly. We don't have to do that much perfectly. Tree pose. Very good. As if you're standing like a tall tree. Very good. Strong tree. And focus at a point. Don't think about anything else. Just focus at a point. If you have lesser thoughts, you'll be able to stay strong without wavering yourself. That's enough. Come back. Now the other side. The other side also. Both legs. Because one side will be stronger. We can do better. 
very good three four five very good so we'll come back is it enough or do one some more stretch enough enough for now okay thank you vidya so yoga these are some of the poses because in this uh, like uh, hall i have limitations i could have given you something else for showing the aerobic uh, effective effectiveness also but uh, we have chairs tables here so next one moving on to lack of sleep sleeping causes as you know your skin age faster impacts your memory mood and cognitive functions thus adequate getting good adequate sleep is very essential so definitely exercise and being active help you to get a good night sleep then stress accelerate aging anything that poses a challenge or threat to our well being is a stress dr arun has uh, already mentioned the details so mental effects anger anxiety depression irritability fatigue restlessness then very simple tips again slow down keep calm be positive take it easy unplug enjoy life have fun breathe relax go outside and meditate shall we do a simple uh, breathing as well yes okay i have got only 6 minutes yes minutes or seconds it is seconds minutes minutes okay fine so everybody keep your both the hands palms on your abdomen keep your eyes closed take a deep breathing breathe out keeping your eyes closed focus only on your breathing and how the abdomen is moving breathe in breathe out next time when you're breathing in just observe how the abdomen is moving okay breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out slowly open your eyes and tell me when you were breathing in how the abdomen was moving supposed to come out was it like that for everybody yes maybe all of your doctors so you know the movement of diaphragm abdominal movement and all so when you do shallow breathing the opposite happens so imagine your abdomen like a balloon so as you fill it with air it should come out it should become bigger same way when you are breathing in the abdomen should become bigger that is called deep abdominal breathing which looks very simple but it is very effective to calm us down we'll do it i um, mean 10 or 15 rounds now let me explain the benefits and it also helps to increase the abdominal uh, blood circulation the internal organs are getting good massage and the imp uh, improves the function of the internal organs shall we do it 10 times continuously ready keep your eyes closed keep your hands on your abdomen i'll count 1 2 3 4 you have to breathe in when i count 4 3 2 1 you have to breathe out very simple try to make it slow no jerk in between ready breathe in 1 2 3 4 breathe out 4 3 2 1 breathe in 1 2 3 4 breathe out 4 3 2 1 breathe in 1 2 3 4 breathe out 4 3 2 1 perfect slowly open your eyes okay so simple breathing technique so if even if you don't have time in the office or in the college when you have 2 minutes time you can practice this instantly it gives you some kind of relaxation so positive thinking and meditation positive thinking and meditation helps us to reduce stress as you know a very simple meditation is a i mean uh, some of you might be thinking it's a very higher spiritual uh, aspect but very simple way you can do the meditation but by just listening to your own breathing okay so let us practice that breath awareness meditation then being in the present moment again as dr arun said many people might be thinking about the past or the future even if the present is very happy and peaceful moment they are agitated thinking about the past or future so let us um, and learn how to live in the present it helps people to make more thoughtful decisions so take home points nourish your body and mind with a healthy balanced diet definitely in moderation you can have everything please don't hate the rice rice is also needed but in minimum quantity you can have moderation is the key word find time to relax and be active throughout the day get good quality sleep and find time to relax and refresh 
yourself regularly. You can come, come to me for a yoga session. I can give you a free yoga session to refresh yourself. And I have a Facebook page, Umas Nutri Yoga. Kindly visit and like my page. Thank you so much for your patient listening. The final session has thus come to an end. For the felicitations, I request Dr. Deepa M. to give away the mementos to Dr. Sarada Snayar and Dr. Srijit N. Kumar. Next, I request Dr. Anand Mantandavale to present the mementos to Dr. Arun Binayar and to Mrs. Uma Kalyani. For winding up, uh, this whole day is dedicated to female health. So, female health is most important for women doctors. IMA is very much concerned about women doctors. So, this whole day is dedicated to Vima. I request Dr. Yamini, the chairperson of Trivandrum Vima, and Dr. Sopna, secretary of Trivandrum Vima, to the stage. And uh, anybody who is not a member of Vima here, please don't raise your hands. But be the member of Vima today itself. Vima is very much concerned about you. So many uh, respected uh, delegates and uh, so many Vima members are present here. So can you raise the hands, Vima members, women doctors? <laughs> okay, some have that. So I request all the women doctors here, assembled here to take membership in uh, women doctors wing, Trivandrum branch. So um, I, <laughs> so we have a lot of activities we have planned to do. Uh, anybody wants to take or, uh, part in our activities can contact me or Yamini Madam or Trivandra branch office. So you can register your name. So already you are becoming members of Women Doctors Wing when you are taking membership in IMA. So uh, I request uh, Yamini Madam to say a few words about our activities. Good evening ladies gathered here. Um, we as women's uh, women doctor wing of uh, IMA Trivandrum, uh, we have a group of women over here who are uh, dedicated to doing something for the society and also for women's health. So we have a lot of activities going on in the women's wing. We would invite all of you to join with us. We have um, right now not only uh, we are focusing not only on the society and on others, but also on ourselves. Like we have already heard over here that you should find some time for yourselves. So there are a few things which we have in mind for the people uh, we had recently. We had a health checkup for all the women doctors who are uh, members of Vima. Uh, a self checkup which is usually lacking among the doctors especially and in among women. So we had a checkup, medical checkup of the women over here. We also have a dance group which is going on. Uh, we have a weekly meeting of the dance group and a dance class which is going on. Another thing which we would like to advertise now is that uh, we would like to have an exercise session for the women. Uh, probably some Zumba or something which is connected to aerobics or exercise on a regular basis. Uh, who are, uh, all those who are interested in, uh, uh, in a regular exercise can also join in with us. Uh, so thank you very much. Please do join in with Vima and our activities. Thank you. One more thing I would li uh, like to add. Uh, thank you Uma for coming here and presenting this wonderful session. Uma has always been very supportive to us in all our activities. So uh, not only yoga, she gives very good tips on diet and uh, exercise and many, many interesting things. Even I am a fan of hers. So uh, you can contact her or you can contact me if you are interested in joining any of her sessions. Thank you. Thank you, madam. And finally, to present the uh, prize money to the final question answer sessions, I invite Dr. Veena Srijit onto the dais to present the awards. Question number 10, Dr. Ragesh. Next question, Dr. Pachi. Question 14, Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi. Congratulations to all the winners. Everything is over. First of all, we thank the faculty members for this wonderful timekeeping. We just landed like Indigo flight. 
we were right in time or little early so thanks to all the faculty members and thanks to all of you for being here till late that's a wonderful time thank you very much from the the team essentials 2019 and this would is very successful because of many people i thank dr veena and dr asna for this wonderful comparing and organizing the program in fact veena is very powerful in, in maintaining the time <laughs> uh, oh thanks to vipin and the uh, uh, extreme media uh, for the wonderful uh, technology support for the conference so and more than that thanks to ima trivandrum and uh, thanks to ima ams panika sir dr srijit uh, everybody to be with us for making this a big success and i request all of you to give a big standing to uh, big oration to uh, applause to our own pran staff who has made the event very very successful or <laughs> also for for the uh, sponsors who support us like like immensely for making this event a big success and all ima staff vimal roy vimal vishnu and all the team i thank them personally for their support so yes our own staff dr sheena who has made the compared all the questions and conducted the, a lot who gave a lot of prizes dr nimisha dr arya dr deepthi so everybody dr jawahar everybody made this event a successful thanks from our heart and be with us thank you very much i request to stand for a minute for national anthem please jagannamana yeah. adinayaka jayahi bharata bhagya vidada punjab sindhu gujarat maratha dravid utkal benga sindhya himachalaya ganga chala jalati taranga शुभनामे जाहे तव शुभ आशीष दाहे आहे तव जय आता जय गणेश